we're here in session number five, which is, I don't know, like the third or the fourth with session that's happened this week. Um, we're going to start now, um, starting with Sushil. Um, and the speakers all have eight minutes to speak. And the, there'll be little gaps in between just for handing over speakers, maybe asking one question and me making intro introductions like this. Um, we're aiming to have a five minute break about 2.40. And then um, we'll come back, we'll wrap it all up in a discussion. Um, that'll start about 10 past three, and we are here together for an hour and a half. Um, so we'll be wrapped up by 3.30, and that's in my time. So um, do the maths, or uh, wherever you might happen to be. Um, Tor Hatterman is the co-convener for this session. He's gonna, um, I haven't actually seen him yet, but he will pop up. And, uh, and hopefully we'll have some good discussions. But we should start. I shall stop sharing and hand things over to Sashil. If you are, and mute my microphone so you can't hear the street behind me. Sashil, are you ready to take it away? Uh, cool. Perfect. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, and uh, thanks to all the organizers and how hard it is to organize something during these times. And it's really cool that you've kept this going. Uh, it looks like a cool uh, bunch of talks are coming up soon. Um, yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sushil Adesamili. I work at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in UC San Diego. I'm a graduate student. My advisor is Helen Fricker, and we work a lot with uh, Laurie Fadman, uh, who is at Earth and Space Research in Oregon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how we can improve uh, estimates of basal melting near ice shelf grounding zones. A uh, real quick background, uh, the reason we care so much about grounding zones is that they disproportionately affect grounded ice flow. So uh, this figure on the left by Ronya Rees, uh, published in 2017, shows this really well. Uh, if you look at a region like uh, Filchner Ronny, uh, thinning of the ice shelf uh, in uh, regions of passive ice, where uh, regions of passive ice doesn't really affect grounded ice flow. And uh, thinning of the ice shelf in uh, regions close to the grounding zone are critical and they can have an uh, immediate effect on grounded ice flow. So we really care about how uh, changes in, how melt rates are changing, changing in these regions. Uh, and if you compare these uh, critical regions to the melt rate data we published on a few months ago, uh, you can see that these critical regions correspond to uh, regions of high melting. So if you focus on Rani Ice Shelf, for instance, uh, uh, there's a region with high buttressing ability uh, near the foundation ice stream, and that's also a region with high melt rates. Uh, so we've got this, uh, I'll just quickly go back. We've got this five-ish kilometer resolution data set of melt rates around Antarctica from Cryosat 2. But this isn't really enough to improve our understanding of grounding zone process because grounding zones are regions with really high changes in topography. So uh, this data from stereophotogrammetry from uh, the Polar Geospatial Center that will give us much higher resolution of melt rates. Uh, this is an example over Bird Inlet and Ross Ice Shelf. Uh, on the left is a previous estimate from Cryosat 2 and you can see uh, it's fairly low resolution. You can see a broad pattern of high melting down here, and there's not that much melting uh, uh, more uh, in more southern portions. But in uh, worldview data, you can see these really cool uh, channelized features of melting. And what you also find is that the peak melt rate uh, in Bird Inlet from worldview data is much higher than the peak melt rate from Cryosat 2 data. And this is really important for calibrating models because a lot of times models are calibrated using the peak melt rates rather than the average melt rates. I just wanted to quickly uh, look at how well models can predict melt rates near the grounding zone. There's a lot of ways you can do this. There's a lot of models you can use. We've uh, worked with Mike Dinneman's five kilometer ROMS model, for instance, but for this talk, because I don't have enough time to show all that, I'll just show uh, model outputs from a plume model. So we're using a very simple one-dimensional plume model developed by Donald Slater. And that includes the effect of buoyant freshwater flux uh, under the ice shelf. And uh, it's actually one of the first times 
this effect has been included in, uh, it's been included in Greenland uh, data a lot, but we're uh, trying to work out if it's important for Antarctica. Uh, so this buoyant freshwater flux drives a plume that drives high melting close to the grounding line, and this melt rate decreases as you go away from the grounding line. And we're going to use this plume model and compare it with the observations and see how well they fit. Uh, so yeah, so this is bird inlet again. Uh, I'll only be focusing on this for this talk. And the black line shows the observations of melt rates. So melt rates kind of start at 18-ish uh, meters an year, go all the way down to zero in about 80 kilometers. Uh, the colored lines show different plume model outputs for different model configurations. Uh, so uh, the Q is the rate of subglacial freshwater discharge. And again, this is discharge from under the ice sheet. Uh, we know there's subglacial freshwater discharge at Bird Glacier because there's observations of subglacial lakes upstream. Lee Stenz has a great paper on that in Nature Geoscience if you're interested. Uh, T is the ocean temperature at the grounding line. We can vary salinity at the grounding line as well, but the ocean temperature matters a lot more. So we've uh, used three different values for temperature. We kind of know that the temperature in this location is about minus 1.9 degrees C from observations of the ice front, but we just went with a colder temperature as well. Uh, we use different rates of subglacial discharge, and the thing that's really interesting here is it doesn't look like models with low rates of subglacial discharge are fitting our observations well near the grounding zone. Uh, down here, it doesn't really matter, but near the grounding zone, it looks like you need some amount of subglacial discharge. This is just three different model configurations, but you can actually do a lot more than that. Uh, so we ran through the entire range of ocean temperatures down here and subglacial discharge. The uncertainty on our melt rate data is about a meter per year, uh, which is around here. So uh, this dark blue region highlights the zone where the observations in the model are fitting really well. Uh, it's nice to see that the expected temperature at the ice front, minus 1.9 degrees C, intersects with that zone of low misfit. And again, uh, this is a 1D model, and it, it is promising that uh, you do need uh, the, ocean temp the observed ocean temperatures are mat matching the, uh, what's expected from the model but we need to be mindful of the limitations of it because the three-dimensional ocean circulation in the cavity on its own could drive the high melt rates without uh, need for subglacial discharge. So we really need to kind of start trying to incorporate subglacial discharge into high-resolution three-dimensional models in this region to uh, examine uh, the uh, different roles of uh, subglacial discharge and uh, just ocean circulation on melting. Uh, this is just one way in which the satellite-derived melt rate estimates can be useful for future modeling efforts. There's a lot of other examples that I can show. Uh, we have some really cool uh, results comparing our data to Mike uh, Dinman's ROMS model. But uh, for now, because this is a fairly short kind of talk, I'll end there. And uh, here's my summary. So it's Bellevue Stereo Photography photogrammetry can be used to improve melt rates uh, near grounding zones and on Antarctica, and this really complements our uh, CRYSAT 2 data set. Uh, I can do these high resolution melt rates anywhere sort of on demand. So I've been working with a couple of collaborators on that. So if you have like a region where you want it, I'd be happy to do it. But don't ask me for Thwaites because there's other people with better Thwaites data than I have. Uh, the plume model outputs show that uh, you can, you need subglacial discharge to explain ice shelf melt near grounding zones, but we use a 1D model and that uh, could potentially not capture the full circulation. Yeah, and finally, I kind of just wanted to put a question out there on how the satellite derived estimates can help modeling efforts. And if you have any thoughts, feel free to email me. That's below. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. That was awesome. Thank you, Sushil. Um, we're going to move on to Julia um, Andresen next. Um, if you have questions for Sushil, you can sneak them into the chat and he'll either answer them there or we can talk about them in the discussion afterwards. Um, we are encouraging participation in the chat and particularly early career questions. But um, first of all, we're about to 
learn some new things about area changes of Antarctic ice shelves from Julia. Are you uh, ready to take it away? Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, okay, so hi everyone. My name is Julia Andreessen and the following presentation covers annual area changes of Antarctic ice shelves from 2009 to 2019. Um, I conducted this research as part of my master's thesis at the University of Leeds with Dr. Anna Hogg. Um, but currently, I am a first year PhD student at the University of Minnesota working with Dr. Peter Nath. So, Antarctic ice shells fringe three quarters of the coastline and are incredibly dynamic in how they change over time. Uh, historically, ice shelf calving front locations have been recorded to either migrate suddenly due to fast continental ice flow, large calving events or collapse, or gradually through steady growth or retreat. Um, this map with the colorful coastline indicates locations of ice shelves that have been previously studied for calving front movement. Additionally, the table below it specifies when these studies took place. Um, these publications are incredibly important in understanding ice shells in historical content, uh, context. However, a circumantarctic survey of ice shelf calving front positions and their migration from 2009 to 2019 does not yet exist. So um, the, in this study, we address the data gap by manually delineating the annual calving locations of 34 ice shelves around Antarctica from 2009 to 2019 using MODIS satellite imagery. Um, our results provide a comprehensive analysis of ice front growth and retreat across Antarctica over the last decade. So to obtain our area values, we used annual multispectral optical images acquired by NASA's MODIS instru instrument. Um, these images were taken during the austral summer from mid-January to the end of February. Uh, to ensure consistent sampling and avoid seasonal variation in the calving front positions. As you can see, the presence of cloud cover, um, a lack of sunlight, or even sea ice reduce the accuracy with which calving front locations can be visually identified. So therefore, image A <laughs> with clear open ocean is an example of our desired image. Now, uh, to calculate the annual areas, we first manually delineated, delineated the calving front locations in each satellite image. So equidistant points were plotted every 500 meters along the ice front using a polar stereographic projection. Um, and this standardized the point density and accuracy of the calving front boundary on every ice shelf. Um, sorry. And then we, <laughs> we also created polygons from both the grounding line positions as well as the calving front location. Um, and then these two images or polygons were intersected, creating a bounded area for each annual record of the ice shelf from 2009 to 2019. Uh, and just to note, isolated islands were not included in the calculation of the areas. So then, combining all of this together, um, this area analysis map is a visual representation of every ice shelf's area growth or retreat with a total of 34 analyzed ice shelves um, and each shelf is color coded by either area loss in red or area gain in blue um, and the associated circles are proportional to each shelf's area change in kilometers squared from 2009 to 2019. Uh, these calculations reveal a marginal continent-wide area increase of 5,196 kilometers squared since 2009, with 18 shelves experiencing retreat and then 16 larger shelves undergo undergoing uh, area growth. So just to look at our data more broadly, um, these maps all show varying ice shelf components, so changes in thickness and volume, our area changes, and then basal melt. But just for the sake of overarching comparison, it's clear that they all display the majority of dynamic change along the West Antarctic ice sheet. So the following slides look at the calving front patterns of our 34 individual shelves, um, specifically highlighting these changes on the waist. So first, um, looking at ice shelves that experienced area retreat, the trend that we first detect are major calving events. So for the sake of this study, we defined a major calving event as the loss of at least 5% of the original area, resulting in the production of one or more icebergs over a short time period. Um, with six total ice shells fitting this criteria, here we highlight Thwaites, which experienced a major calving event in 2012, uh, losing 2,786 kilometers squared, which was 51% of its original area in 2009 
and resulting in an overall area difference of 2,924 kilometers squared from 2009 to 2019. Um, our second retreating trend that we noticed was gradual or steady retreat. Um, these ice shelves are often embedded or surrounded by grounded features such as islands um, that prevent the ice from accumulating thickness and allowing them to be more subject to external but small ablating forces. Um, so featured here is Getz West ice shelf um, losing a total of 222 kilometers squared from 2009 to 2019 um, and Getz is one of eight ice shelves to experience this gradual or marginal retreat over the past 10 years. Um, our third retreating trend is retreat with periodic growth. Um, so this category defines areas that experience individual years of marginal growth, but an overall larger retreat. These shelves are um, often fed by fast flowing glaciers, um, creating patterns of rapid retreat with frequent regrowth, increasing their susceptibility to capping. So with four total ice shelves exhibiting this behavior, um, we highlight Pine Island, which experienced an overall loss of 1,044 kilometers squared, which was 17% of its original area, and with periods of intermittent area advance throughout the decade. So now looking at advancing ice shelves, our first category is steady growth. Um, steady growth defines gradual accumulation that results in an overall area growth that is at most 4% larger than its original area. And these ice shelves are extremely thick and expansive, allowing them to retain their stability as they accumulate surface area. Um, Ross East is one of eight total ice shelves that demonstrates this uh, steady trend with a total growth of 2,055 kilometers squared um, from 2009 to 2019. Our second advancing trend is categorized as growth with periodic retreat. Um, so this pattern defines areas that have faced overall growth but have intermittent durations of retreat um, and these shelves are often highly prone to small calving events but any ablation is then balanced by periods of accumulation and area growth. Um, as one of four ice shelves, Dotson is experiencing an overall growth of 52 kilometers squared um, but this was also throughout a, a small period of loss which was 52 kilometers squared um, in 2016 due to calving. And lastly, our last ice shelf category is rapid growth um, and includes four total ice shelves. Rapid growth defines areas that experience total growth um, of over 5% from 2009 to 2019. And these areas are often located along fast flowing glaciers um, and in the case of Crossen are developing expansive crevasses. So featured here, Crossen attained 295 kilometers squared over the span of 10 years, which was 8.3% of its original growth. So to combine all these together and give you more of a, an overall visual, um, after analyzing these six trends, we then assess each category based on area percentage change since 2009 to get a better sense of how each shelf compares to the other shelves. Um, and each category upholds certain statistical requirements based on the migration of these shelves during our decadal time period. So in conclusion, um, it's important to know that these decade-long analyses are not extensive enough to provide definitive shelf trends. So uh, these results in categorization, however, they bring, to, um, they bring attention to areas around the entire continent that are undergoing current dramatic or steady change. Um, so we hope and anticipate our analysis to be a starting point for continued measurement of Antarctica's ice shelves and their movement. Um, so as a PhD student, <laughs> I aim to continue this exploration of Antarctica with Peter as we delve into the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and continue using it to combine you know, remote sensing images, um, ground-based observations, and climate reanalysis data to under understand this rapidly changing area. Um, and just to wrap up, a big thank you to Dr. Anna Hogg and Heather Seeley for making this work possible during my time at Leeds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. That's an amazing data compilation you've put together. Um, if you have questions, again, they can go in the chat or we can have them in the discussion. But I want to just move along and um, go to Bernd Kulesa, who is next up on the speaking order and has command of the screen. Hey, okay. um, thank you. Do you have thank everything you, you need? Yeah. Can, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, thanks very much. Um, so I'm very much giving this talk on behalf of uh, Siobhan Killingbeck, who's the uh, kind of whiz kid behind uh, the um, 
plays and joint inversion um, that we've been championing with, with this particular talk here, and I'll, I'll explain to you why we might want to do that. Um, and unfortunately, she sent me the results basically just before she ran off on annual leave um, and left, left me to put this talk together. So I'm going to try and sell, sell the main points uh, I think she, she was hoping to make. Uh, and yeah. So first of all, um, why, why do we worry about the fern on Lars and C? Um, well, if we uh, look back about 40 years, so here's a nice compilation that Suzanne Bevan made. We can see there's been an awful lot of melting happening on Lars and C. Sometimes the entire ice shelf has melted. In other uh, more typical years, um, we have uh, most melt in the north and in the inlets here with less melt in the uh, southeast over here. But overall, um, there would have been a lot of melting and refreezing of fern. And we know from um, a lot of our previous work um, that um, this leads to very significant modifications of uh, the fern layer. So here's an artist's impression of a massive ice layer that we detected on Lars and Sea in the Cabinet Inlet a, a few years ago. Uh, from melt ponds that have effectively been frozen and, and stacked on, on top of each other. So what we need really is uh, methods that can actually measure this um, it, so, so that we can basically estimate the physical properties of these um, bodies. So we need to detect them, characterize the physical properties, and then we'd like to stick them into a numerical uh, ice shelf model so we can simulate the impact on, on flow and fracture. Now traditionally we'd use seismic refraction data to um, provide fern density profiles, but actually that only works uh, if you're in a very, very cold uh, area where the fern hasn't been modified by melting at all. We've got a paper currently in review that demonstrates that very nicely. And so we need something else to do that. Um, and so the question is, uh, what now? And um, this method potentially here is a way uh, of, of doing this, um, which is the um, spectral analysis of uh, seismic surface or Rayleigh waves which actually is something that's very widely used in geotechnical site investigations to provide um, ideas of the um, ground structure and stability. And the question is, can this, for example, help in this case, which actually is pretty analogous to that. So traditionally, we'd pick the refraction, the first breaks, invert those for fern density. And as you will see in a little bit, that doesn't work very well. Um, and so in this talk here, we're going to fo focus on the surface waves, which is this big dispersive package here. And then down here is just the body wave, the period reflection from the ice shelf base in this case. Um, and so what I'll show you um, is the um, data we have analyzed so far, which is where all these black crosses are. And we'll compare them with borehole um, measured uh, density profiles, um, which are in these uh, red locations here. They were obtained from borehole uh, optical televiewer. Can I derail you for one moment? and say that people really want to see the details in the in the slides. Can you put it onto full um, presentation display? Oh, sorry, um, it's on full on my screen here. So. Uh, sorry for throwing that one at you. Yeah, no, hang on, let me. Give me a second, I'll try. And And that's as it was before, so maybe just uh, people are going to have to zoom in up here. How about that? <laughs> is, is this better now? <gasps> that's perfect. Whatever you did just then, that, that really worked. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, I've got a second screen here and I switched it off. But for some reason, it sprung into action when I started my talk. I don't... <laughs> Magic. Okay. Sorry about that. I won't bill you for the minute. Yeah, <laughs> On you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, that was uh, not intended. <laughs> it's good you let me know. Okay, um, so the, yeah, so the, the, the red dots, we basically have uh, borehole density profiles from optical televia uh, studies. And so what we do with our seismogram, like the one you just saw, we basically transform it into the phase velocity frequency space. Then the surface waves very nicely uh, uh, separate from the body waves. And this is the um, zoomed in area on the uh, right here. Um, there's various different modes. The one we're most interested in for now is the fundamental mode of the uh, dispersion curve, so we can pick this one along with the uh, uncertainty here. Um, and then before we even do anything fancy with it, um, we can do that for our different uh, seismic spots, which are basically these black crosses here from P0 to P120. And what you can clearly see is uh, where we have uh, P0, for example, the phase velocity is pretty high. And the further we go along um, our black crosses here, the lower the phase velocity uh, ends up being. 
Um, and we can explain this by, um, if you imagine there's more melting and refreezing happens here, we have more massive ice forming. So the elastic modulus massively increases and therefore the um, shear wave velocity also massively increases and the phase velocity along with it. Um, and this is pretty much what we're seeing very, very nicely in this, in this image here. The same works for uh, Whirlwind Inlet and other spots where we uh, make these uh, measurements. Okay, and then we can take these dispersion curves and we can put them into our probabilistic Bayesian uh, algorithm multi three, and we can invert the dispersion curves then jointly with P wave profiles from our seismic refraction work, as well as borehole density logs or density profiles from the seismic refraction itself. Actually, it turns out um, that both of those work pretty well, which is very encouraging uh, for future work. And then we get posterior or, or post-inversion depth profiles of shear wave velocity, p-wave velocity and uh, density. And so here are some examples for uh, three spots. And I noticed when I was putting it uh, this morning as I was going through it, uh, she won and renamed this. So CI0 is here and CI120 is there. For some reason, the P got lost and the CI came in. But um, point is that in the um, inlet, um, cabinet inlet, there's very little fern. Um, there's pretty much just a uh, refrozen ice um, here, as you can see. So the, yellow, the white line is the um, density through the um, uh, fern column um, at the top of the ice shelf down to 40 meters. And the other thing is we also have the raw optical uh, televiewer data here. So the, the more black, basically, the more refreezing, the more white, the more uh, it resembles original fern. Um, and we can see as we move from uh, CI0 to 120, we get more white in our colors, um, so less refreezing. We can also see, if we look at the white curves, that we have a more um, sort of fluffier fern on top the further we go away um, from the um, inlet itself. And the other thing that we can see, so we have the um, three shear wave profiles derived from our inversion here that you can see. Um, and what we can see very nicely is um, that um, these um, shear wave inversions basically ni very nicely reflect um, the base of the um, fern and where they transition into the massive ice um, where we have our refrozen ice layers in, in all of these cases. Um, so that, that is really good. They're also very, very good at reconstructing the density of the fern itself. I don't really have time to talk about all this in too much detail now in eight minutes. Um, so what I've done instead is I've just summarized um, basically a, an interpolated map um, of the results that we have so far. And so here's VS, the average from five to 15 meters depth. And we can see that the pattern itself um, matches very nicely the typical melt pattern where we have more melt in the north in the inlets compared to the south. And this is nicely reflected in the variability in our, our shear wave velocities. And if we look at shear wave velocities of 15 to 25 and 25 to 45 meters depth, we retain this kind of north-south gradient um, that we have. And, but overall, the shear wave velocity increases as our, our fern increases overall. And this very nicely reflects um, what we had uh, found previously or, or modeled previously, which was that we basically have centuries of melt on Lars and Sea that have, have occurred there for many, many years in the past. And the VS profiles are very good at, at giving like real quantitative uh, values that we can use in order to derive densities and various other properties that we might want for um, uh, ice shelf modeling. Then the final point, um, this is not quite finished yet, but we did, we observed um, that if we compare for the same spot, um, so there's a location here that we visited in 2008-9 and then we visited in 2017-18. Well, first of all, you can see there's a lot more melting that was happening in 2008-9 compared to 2017-18. Um, and if we pick the dispersion curve, so again, here we have frequency, here we have phase velocity, we can see that the phase velocities are actually a lot higher in 2008-9 compared to 2017-18. And so we might actually be able to look at changes in fern properties and melting and refreezing over time doing this. And what's quite interesting about this is if we um, zoom into our melt images, um, and so the 2008-9 data were here, the 2017-18 data are here. And if we now look at the amount of melting that's happened beforehand, then actually we can see it was pretty warm for very many years before we got to 2008-9. But then for many years, up until about 2015, 16, it was actually relatively cold on Lars and Sea with relatively little melt happening. And the question is whether therefore we have um, a lot like the snow accumulation, we have a lot less uh, melting and refreezing happening. So we have a lot more fluffy snow and fern and that potentially might then uh, uh, decrease our, our shear wave velocities 
um, simply because we have um, the, the elastic modulus of fluff is grown as a lot less than it is for refrozen uh, ice, um, and therefore that might basically explain this. And so my last slide now is just to show you in the future, there's actually, there's a lot more seismic data we still need to analyze, which is where um, all of these dots on that map you can see. And there's a lot of smaller wiggles that we basically observe deeper down, and we're sort of matching these up with the density profiles at the moment to, to see how far we can actually push this analysis down the um, burn column itself. So basically, the take home message is uh, that the uh, Bayesian inversion of shear wave profiles is a really, really good way to characterize burn density, and especially where we have refrozen ice layers, which might solve one of our, our problems that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bern. I, uh, I love a talk that ends with it might solve all our problems. <laughs> And um, I'm, I'm sure there will be questions and interest, but I am, I'm gonna push those into the discussion as well, just so that we can keep along on track. And um, make way for Lynn Kalizianski, who's the next speaker. Um, are you ready to claim the screen? Yes, you are. And are you, yeah, presentation view. Perfect. Okay, I'll let you take it away. Unmute. Great. Um, yeah, okay. Brief introduction. Um, my name is Lynn Kalizinski. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Maine. I'm also a student trainee at um, Crow, um, and right now I'm a visiting student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and so I'll dive into some background. Okay. Great. Um, so I just want to start with a brief introduction on large-scale Ross ice shelf dynamics. Many of you are aware of several recent uh, studies exploring buttressing potential of Antarctic ice shelves, as well as many over the past year studying the Ross ice shelf sensitivity to basal melting as well as other forcings. Um, one paper that's already been mentioned and I'd like to highlight is the Reese et al. paper. Um, they uh, coined a term called uh, telebuttressing or the idea that uh, localized ice shelf thinning can ex accelerate ice flow in regions far from the initial perturbation. So on the left, this is um, showing the maximal, um, maximum response difference for a model perturbation. So they took a 20 by 20 kilometer grid cell and uh, thinned it by a meter, and then looked at how far that per perturbation um, made it across the ice shelf. Um, and they, um, highlighted the western lateral margin of the Ross ice shelf as an area particularly sensitive to thinning. So if we combine this with some of the recent observations and modeling work um, coming out of um, the Rosetta project, as well as others, um, we believe that, that summer melt, um, uh, basal summer melt rates in this area are relatively high. Um, so this is um, showing summer um, melt rates about 10 meters per year in this region. And uh, the big implication is that this region is a key area of vulnerability. Um, and I found this interesting um, in particular because my work has uh, focused on the McMurdo shear zone, which is um, the western lateral margin the, um, caused by the shear between the Ross Ice Shelf and the McMurdo Ice Shelf. And um, my colleagues and I have been traveling to this region for several years collecting GPS observations and GPR data um, to study the structure and kinematics of this region. And one important finding that has come out of this work is that we found evidence for basal marine ice. Um, so this is a, a 200 megahertz um, transect going across the ice shelf. Um, and this is um, uh, showing um, depth uh, for the transect. And what we found is uh, we picked up on a bright reflector at approximately uh, 160 meters, um, which we interpreted to be the transition from meteoric ice to basal marine ice uh, frozen on underneath the ice shelf. And we we're actually able to penetrate to another 10 meters through this layer and see some structure uh, before we lost the signal. So from our um, observations, we know the ice is at least 170 to 180 meters thick we were actually able to see that far into the ice shelf, um, but we weren't able to see to the bottom of the ice shelf. So um, the next thing I wanted to do was um, do an ice thickness estimation. Um, so using the information um, from our surface elevation from GPS, 
um, as well as um, fern densities from the region and marine ice density estimates from literature, um, which we believe to be more dense than the meteoric ice. That combined with the, um, the depth of this um, transition, um, I was able to estimate ice thickness to between 190 to 220 meters. So um, using this estimation, uh, we believe that uh, the marine ice layer is somewhere between 40 to 60 meters thick across the shear zone. So comparing this to some of the more widely used remote sensing data sets, um, the top line is BEDMAP2. Um, so this is a data set uh, commonly used in, in um, modeling studies and all the modeling studies I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, the thickness from BEDMAP2 shows uh, that it's between 70 meters is what they estimate. Um, and the big takeaway take is that our estimation of ice thickness is more than three times as thick as that um, data set. Um, and even our direct observations, again, we were able to penetrate to 180 meters, um, are more thick than some of the other better data sets, including Ben Machine and Rosetta. So what does this discrepancy mean for uh, sensitivity to changes in this region? Um, so the good news is that um, some of the newer data sets coming out are much better than um, the BEDMAP2 data. Um, so what I wanted to do was a modeling analysis um, initialized by BEDMAP2 data and um, BED machine data um, to look at how sensitive um, the model is to initialization and temperature along the McMurdo shear zone. So um, I did a comparison study um, within ISSM. Um, I don't have time to go into methods too much, um, but this is showing um, the modeled velocity for one of the scenarios um, after I solved the transient stress balance solution and allowed the um, model to relax over 300 years. Um, I do want to point out that I ran this model on my laptop and um, I don't believe 300 years is enough for full relaxation. So I'll talk about how I dealt with that in the analysis. Um, but after the 300 year simulation, um, I initialized each model by um, applying a five meter thinning um, to a 20 by 20 kilometer grid within the shear zone. So for my two case studies, um, I initialized one using BEDMAP2 ice thickness data and one um, using bed machine data. Again, because we believe it's um, um, better um, or more accurate and more close to observations. And um, these two figures are just showing the ice thickness after relaxation. Um, so looking at the difference between the two, this is showing bed machine minus bed not two ice thickness. Again, um, I just want to point out that um, bed machine is over 100 meters thicker than bed not two um, in this key area of interest. So for each uh, scenario, um, I deployed a five meter thinning, again, across a 20 by 20 kilometer grid. Um, and then I solved a 10-year transient stress balance solution to look at changes in velocity and flux across the grounding line. So real quickly, um, some of the modeling results. Um, comparing the two models, this is showing the change in velocity due to that five meter thinning. Um, and this is showing the change in velocity at the end of the 10-year simulation. Um, again, because the model isn't fully relaxed, this is the difference between um, a 10-year simulation that was forced and a 10-year simulation that wasn't forced after relaxation. Um, so that's just trying to get rid of um, some of the transient effects that still could be there. Um, and so these two figures could be interpreted as the change in velocity due to that perturbation. Um, we see that the BEDMAP2 scenario shows a greater change in velocity magnitude um, that makes it further um, or stretches further across the ice shelf. And this shouldn't be surprising. Um, it makes sense because we're thinning um, an ice shelf that's um, thinner to begin with in our region of interest. Um, so it, um, it should be more sensitive. Um, in the bottom right, I um, compared um, the average change in flux across the grounding line and the total change in flux over the 10-year scenario. Um, and um, one key takeaway is that the bed map two change in flux was um, more than twice that of the bed machine scenario. So um, to summarize, our GPR observations show that the ice thickness is 
greatly underestimated by the BEMAC2 data set, which is widely used in many modeling studies. Um, by comparing models initialized by BEMAC2 and bed machine, again, because bed machine is closer to our estimates of ice thickness, um, we know that the stress balance and flux across the grounding line is um, particularly sensitive to um, initial thickness estimates. Um, because the McMurdo shear zone area is, um, uh, is a particular area of vulnerability, better ice thickness estimates are needed um, um, and are key to predicting future evolution of the Ross ice shelf. Um, and sort of larger picture and on the larger scale, um, ice thickness estimates could um, greatly be improved by observations of marine ice location, thickness, and potentially, uh, particularly density. Um, with that, I'm over time, so I'll just leave some of the bullet points for future work. Um, and we'll, I guess, end the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, and uh, I'm sure there is a lot that we can talk about, but uh, again, shoving it all into the discussion um, so that we can just take a five minute, turn your screen off, spin yourself around, whatever you need to do to keep your head in the game. Um, and we're, we're going to come back in five minutes time. That's going to be at something 45 um, to resume the rest of the session. Well, five minutes goes by in a hurry, and I don't know if anybody genuinely left, um, but I think it's time to resume the session and uh, see what more we can learn today. Uh, Elizabeth Urban, are you here and ready? You are. Hi there. Yeah. <laughs> so our next speaker is going to be Elizabeth Urban, who's going to be talking about constraints on geothermal flux. And if you want to seize the screen, we can go from there. All right, a uh, quick introduction. My name is Elizabeth Urban. I'm a senior at the University of Washington. I'm here to discuss a project that's taking place over the previous summers. My project team consists of myself, as well as Sir Bibiani, who is another UW senior, and our mentor and advisor, TJ Fudge. Uh, Serbi and I were connected to this project from the Washington NASA Space Grant Consortium. Uh, they aim to connect undergrads in the STEM fields with resources and research opportunities. And beyond TJ and Space Grant, we've had collaborators from Dartmouth, Norwegian Polar Institute, CU Boulder, and some other collaborators from UW as well. We are interested in adding constraints to geothermal flux in Antarctica. Uh, geothermal flux is a useful boundary condition for ice sheet modeling and direct measurements are few and far between. Our methods estimate the maximum geothermal flux via numeric modeling, and we can compare these to inferences from remote sensing and observations. We utilized coastal ice domes with observed Raymond arches, which indicates ice is frozen to the bed. We are pretty comfortable with the assumption that they are frozen because sliding reduces the Raymond effect and all drilled Raymond arches have been frozen at the bed. Uh, it's possible to find the maximum heat flux with the frozen bed, because we can model when melt would begin with these ice domes. And this is a similar concept to using subglacial lakes to estimate minimum flux. If the flux is too low, then the lakes would be frozen. So to find the maximum geothermal flux, we modeled in glacier temperature profiles at coastal ice domes. We used a one-dimensional ice and heat flow model, transient time to get these temperature profiles. Uh, our inputs were the temperature history, accumulation history, vertical velocity history, and ice thickness history. We then incrementally increase the geothermal flux and force the model with surface temperature history until the temperature profile shows basal melt. Um, we validated this model at Seipel Dome, which has borehole temperature data that our glacial temperature profile could match reasonably well. At Seipel Dome, we were also able to see that our maximum geothermal flux estimate isn't significantly affected by the presence of a basal temperature. Uh, there isn't really a large difference between that and the pressure melting point here. Uh, we addressed uncertainty by varying the forcings with reasonable differences in history. And if you are interested in the nitty gritty of this, I would direct you to the paper that was published in GRL in 2019. Uh, the first leg of this project was done by Serbi Biani in 2018 and focused on the Ross Ice Shelf region with the intention to significantly increase constraints in that region. The second leg was done by myself in 2019 I took this method of estimating maximum geothermal flux and attempted to find constraints elsewhere in Antarctica, 
specifically in Drowning Mod Land and Adelaide Island uh, via extensive literature review. In the Ross Ice Shelf region, our estimations of maximum flux at Inglehart and Shabtai Ridge agree with the recorded values at Seifel Dome. Uh, we then compared our estimates to maximums for two continental scale remote sensing based models. Uh, on the left, the Martos et al. map is based on Curie temperature, and on the right, the On et al. map is based on seismic data. Uh, when comparing our maximum estimates with the Martos et al. paper, the elevated heat flow did not appear to exist at Inglehart and Shabtai Ridge. And when comparing with the on et al map, our maximum values were higher than their estimates, so we can't quite get results from this. It was consistent results, but we can't really confirm any new constraints. And when we compare our estimates of the maximum flux to other estimates and observations in this region, uh, we can find that our constraints correspond with the sediment probe that you can see at the grounding zone, and the high value at uh, subglacial Lake Willens uh, doesn't seem to be widespread. And then after the Ross Ice Shelf domes have been utilized, I took a look at other coastal ice domes with model Raymond arches, and I conducted a literature review to find temperature, accumulation, vertical velocity, and ice thickness history to force this model. Uh, we found plenty of data in Drowning Modland, but unfortunately, our constraints were significantly higher than other models, kind of rendering our upper limits less useful because our maximums were quite high. They were in the range of 150 milliwatts per square meter. Um, due to these higher accumulation rates up in drowning mudland, which leads to greater infection down at the bed. This is, of course, in contrast to the really prime stuff we could find down in the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, they have lower accumulation rates, and the maximums can be used to constrain things a little more. Um, we were also able to add constraints on Adelaide Island, which is a region that has been modeled to have very high heat flux. So in this case, the warmer surface temperature yields a high maximum flux, but our estimate was still lower than previous constraints. So our maximum on Adelaide Island was 105 milliwatts per square meter with a large uncertainty, but even with this large uncertainty bound, our data points towards a lower value for the maximum geothermal flux than previously modeled. And similar to the Ross Ice Shelf region, we do not support the regions of higher geothermal flux because our maximum estimates fall below of the previous model. So in conclusion, this is a modeling technique that can provide additional constraints to geothermal flux in Antarctica. The uh, bulk of our measurements gives uh, uh, supports continental values in the basin and range. And uh, this is a project that is a really great way to give undergrads such as myself and Serbi involved in this research via numeric modeling. And I'll leave with a final note that if you have other locations with Raymond Arches, uh, my advisor TJ would love to continue to torture undergrads with using these uh, values. Okay, <clears throat> thanks so much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, this is Tori speaking. Um, I think uh, is there is there one quick question otherwise i think uh, uh, rob can can start his uh, presentation and uh, drive us through the remains of lost pinning point but maybe if there's one quick question for clarifications or anything no this doesn't seem to be the case rob are you ready to share your screen How's that? Did you have that? Whoops. Yes, that's great. Okay. Um, very brief introduction because time is short. So I'm Rob Larter. I'm a marine geophysicist at British Antarctic Survey and one of the PIs of the Thwaites Offshore Research Project. One of the things we've been doing in the project is uh, examining past pinning points uh, to see how they evolve and how they might affect uh, glacial stability and flow. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just present a few general ideas and a couple of data examples. Um, uh, for anybody who went to the uh, ITGC meeting earlier, this is the same as I presented there, but there will be a substantially different audience, I think, at Waste, so I thought it was worth rerunning. So uh, this is a diagram that many people will be familiar with, but I think there's, there's something quite significant missing from it, because we, we talk a lot about the buttressing effect of ice shelves, but in reality, the ice shelf you're looking at here isn't doing a lot of buttressing. And that's because most of the back stress comes from, from an ice shelf comes from drag along the sides or where it's going over pinning points. So let's put a pinning point on there. 
And apart from the back stress, uh, pinning points also have a number of other effects. They can divert the ice flow, uh, they, they can affect the carving style, and they're certainly going to affect uh, the, how the uh, ocean circulates in and out of the cavity. So we need to understand how uh, pinning points evolve and, and how they uh, affect uh, glacial dynamics and other processes as they do so. So first of all, before going on, let's have a look at where the pinning points are in Thwaites. This, is, these are the, uh, this, this figure shows the, the grounding lights, lines mapped from SAR interferometry by Eric Rigno and colleagues. And if we zoom into the Thwaites region, you can see that there's a, there's, there's a large uh, pinned area near the tip of the eastern ice shelf. And uh, well, there used to be a pinning point under the glacier tongue. Uh, that's probably not there anymore. So the, the pinning points at the tip of the eastern ice shelf if you look at the, the velocities, which are represented in color, you can see that that's backing up the ice considerably, and that results in a, a shear zone uh, between the, the eastern ice shelf and the glacier tongue. If we now move offshore and look at our uh, new multi-beam bathymetry recently published in the cryosphere, you can see that the pinning points are sat situated on much larger bathymetric highs. And by the way, the view is rotated now, so north is towards the, the, the top of the page. Uh, and something else significant I point out here is from a core site that exists here, uh, we know that the grounding line retreated beyond this point more than 10,000 years ago. We know that because there's a very consistent set of radiocarbon dates in the core that show rapid accumulation after the ice retreat quite early in, in the Holocene. Um, so quite slow flow. So what I want to do now is just walk through uh, a sort of thought experiment about how pinning points may evolve under a thinning ice sheet. So we're starting off with a, a, a very common kind of schematic where a grounding line is pinned on a bedrock ridge. Uh, in most of these diagrams, you have this kind of hard immutable bed. But in reality, we know a lot of fast flowing glaciers have a basal debris layer or a mobile till layer underneath them. So they're transporting sediments to, to the grounding line. And if the grounding zone remains relatively fixed for a period of time, as we expect it has because of a, a, the slow retreat, we can expect that this will build a grounding zone wedge. Now, if the ice start is thinning and the sediment delivery rate is high enough, as the ice thins, that, ground, that sediment, it'll build up, it'll grade the grounding zone wedge so it stays in contact with the base of the ice. And if the thinning continues, eventually you may, you may get a cavity forming, in which case you're cutting off the conveyor belt of sediment supply. So after this, you may expect continued thinning will, uh, will lead to, to separation. So what I want to do now is look at what we may be left with in this box here. So first of all, if we just simply separate, if, if the, uh, the, the ice shelf just thins and, and breaks up and comes away from the pinning point, we may be left with something like this with a smear of sediment over the top, and I refer to this as a thick spread pinning point. It's, so it's like somebody's put a really thick slap uh, paste of, of peanut butter on their toast. Something else we've got to think about in this situation is if, if we've got thinning ice, we've probably got uh, glacial isostatic uplift. And, and particularly if uh, we've had faster, a period of faster thinning than a period of slower thinning, the, the uplift may uh, keep the, the pinning point in contact with the base of the ice even though the ice is thinning. And then we may get uh, the hard core of a pinning point outcropping over the center of the high with just some sediment on the sides. And a, a third thing situation I'd want, to, so I'll call that the scrapes. That's like when you scrape the burnt toast. Uh, the third situation is if we have a, a, a bedrock with an irregular surface, we may get sediment plastered into the depressions on, on the surface of, of a relatively hard uh, pinning point. So one thing I also want you to note on all these diagrams, there's a, a very slow surface gradient uh, back upstream because that's the, the kind of profile you expect on the base of an ice shelf. So how do we go about uh, imaging sediments uh, on pinning points or anywhere offshore? Well, a, a lot of you have probably seen uh, sort of records like this. This is an acoustic, uh, acoustic profiler record from a uh, sub-bottom profile from the Palmer. Many oceanographic reverse vessels have these. They can produce very nice records like this one. But really all you're seeing here is, is the mud, the, the very fine grained sediments and water rich sediments. If you've got uh, any significant thickness of sand or, or compacted sediments, that'll just look like bedrock. So in order to see the full picture, you need something with a, a lower frequency sound source. These things are several kilohertz. 
lower frequency sound source. So what we used this year on the Palmer was a pair of generator injector air guns and a sensitive hydrophone streamer to get some uh, some seismic data that can can see uh, the the more difficult to image sediments. Before I just show a couple of seismic examples, uh, just just have a look at what. Um, our new multi-beam data tells us about the morphology of pinning points. So in the center panel here, there's a, lot, a selected set of profiles across bathymetric highs in the Pine Island Bay region, uh, arranged in, in the direction of flow. And what I want you to, to note here is that, in general, these show this, this shallow uh, upstream dip that I've, I've talked about. The, the insects show where a couple of these particular ones were selected from, one, one offshore the Getz and one in, in Pine Island Bay. Uh, particularly this Getz one, I think the detailed geomorphology here gives you a clue that there's probably some sediment involved, the very smooth uh, tails from the, the crag and tail arrangement, for example. So let's just have a quick look uh, at some, some seismic examples. This is one of our new high-res seismic profiles. It's actually across the, the high just north of the, the edge of the high just north of the Eastern Ice Shelf. And I think you can see that this, uh, th this, this shows what I've highlighted here in, in uh, transparent orange. You can see there are sediments on the, uh, on the flanks of the high. I think you can also see, if you look carefully, that the, there is some plastered into depressions, as I hypothesized. And one more example, it is, uh, this is a pinning point, uh, this is a, a bathymetric high on the northern side of, of uh, Pine Island Bay in the direction of presumed past flow. You can see it's got this upstream dip. The, the, true, the true dip here is about half a degree. But in this case, you can see, I think quite clearly, there's a sediment accreted to the, the upstream side of the high. And I think, although it's a little less clear, I think this little bump on the downstream side is a sedimentary construction and the, the sediment uh, down the, down the uh, downstream flank. So uh, I don't know how I'm for time, but just uh, the takeaway points I, I, I want to, to mention are that uh, the geometry and nature of pinning points matter. We, we can understand these a little bit from looking at the, the past ones. They matter because they stabilize ice shells, they may slow and divert ice flow, affect carving style, uh, and they certainly constrain the, the circulation in the cavity. And an important thing is pinning points are probably not all the same. And that to really find out uh, about their nature and their differences, we really need uh, seismic data with, you know, in the hundreds of hertz frequencies. Okay, I'll stop there. All right, thanks, Rob. You were indeed perfect in time, so this is this is really nice. Um, if if nobody else has a question, I will ask a short one just for clarification on the terminology because you mentioned pinning points, but in some drawings it appears that there were ice risers. But do you use these terms interchangeably, or do you think pinning point is something smaller? Uh, well, uh, I mean, a pinning point could be a, a nice rise. I think that the, the sort of ones I was drawing would be ones that cause rumples. Uh, I think we're looking at, I mean, I don't know. I think it's a moot point whether the one at the tip of the eastern ice shelf is, is an ice rise or not. As I understand it, most of the ice flow goes off to one side of it. Right. Okay. Well, that, I mean, details can be taken up yeah. in the discussion. I just wanted to clarify okay. the terminology. Um, I think next speaker is Kia Riverman. If you're ready and want to share the screen. And, uh, just yeah. go ahead. About yes. yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Kaya Riverman, and I am currently a postdoc at NYU. And today I'm going to be uh, telling you a little bit about um, some bending that we observe across the grounding zone of weights. Um, and then put a little bit of thought into how stable is this grounding zone at present based on some seismic observations we've made across the grounding zone. Okay, so uh, there's been this idea that we can, we can treat grounding zones as estuaries. Um, it's come from several lines of thinking. Um, and this is the idea that melt water is able to certainly flow from up glacier out into the ocean, but that in certain places at certain times, there's actually seawater that's able to inflow up, up glacier of the grounding zone as well. Um, and one mechanism that might be responsible for this um, is tidal forcing. Um, and the reason we want to think about this at all really is that this is going to extend the area over which we possibly have ocean-driven melt, um, as well as have an influence on uh, sliding of the ice right across the grounding zone. 
And so, like I said, tidal flexure can potentially be responsible for this pumping up glacier of seawater. Um, this idea was first kind of modeled by Ryan Walker in a 2013 paper. And he showed that where grounding zones are pinned um, on a point, so this is going to be somewhere where you have rough topography um, or steep bed slopes, um, that if with that, with that pinning, with subsequent tidal variation, um, that there can be this elastic response of the ice inland um, that can produce this low pressure zone at the bed and possibly drive inflow of seawater. And this has been um, theoretically described and modeled, but not yet observed um, until the work I'm going to show you today. So what I'm going to show is a seismic line and series of tilt meters um, across the eastern um, Thwaites Shelf grounding zone. So we're looking up here. Um, here is the 1617 grounding line, a bunch of pics from this Molello paper we've all seen a lot from. Um, and so I'm going to be showing a seismic line that's about nine kilometers long, um, across this transect and tilt meters from these locations. So just jumping into these tilt records right away, what I'm gonna show on the next screen is the, the tilt results. Um, and at the top of the screen is gonna be grounded ice and then we'll be moving down glacier. So here we see um, these tilt results and the gray lines behind are the tides at this point in time from CATS 2008. Um, and then the colored lines are the tilt response um, at the same time. And what you can see, um, kind of if you squint your eyes and look down, um, is that the more afloat we are and the further down glacier we are, the, um, the closer the correlation with tides. Um, instead of looking at this in this space though, let's actually think about it in correlation space. And so um, this is that same transect. We're looking at surface elevation here. So you can see um, the grounding zone sits right about here um, that we know from our seismic data. And so, we see this slope break going out um, to flotation. And so each of these colored dots are tilt meter measurements. Um, and this um, plot down here is the actual correlation with tides. And so you can see that for the most afloat ice, um, we have a really strong correlation with tides. Um, and as you get closer to the grounding zone, um, we switch into a negative correlation with the tides. So this is evidence for that elastic flexure that's out of phase with the tides or has a negative polarity relative to the tides. Um, and I think this is good evidence for the fact that potentially at this location, we could be seeing tidal pumping across this zone. And because we have tilt meters further inland as well, it gives us kind of a spatial constraint over which we could possibly see tidal pumping in this area. Okay, moving on to um, what the seismic work looks like in this area. Um, here's that same surface elevation profile, um, and here's the ice bottom profile, and here is the seafloor elevation. Um, not really going to go into the methods here too strongly, but um, it's the active seismic bread and butter that um, Shridhar's group has been doing for a long time. So we've got 48 channel um, active source um, with an explosion at a couple meters depth. Um, the processing that's been done here is primarily um, doing a travel time inversion to nicely account for um, ice slope and sea force slope. So we're accounting for both of those slopes um, in the elevations presented here. And so you can see, here's the grounding zone, um, and there are some features along the bed through here. Um, these are grounding zones from previous years. So we see a bit of a bedrock feature um, around where the 2011 grounding zone sat. Um, and then looking at the, these are all of the picks from the 1617 grounding zone. Um, and so you can see at present, the present grounding zone sits kind of within this band of measurements made across 2016, 2017. So we really haven't seen strong retreat of this grounding zone since that time. Maybe a little bit in that um, we're certainly no longer tidally grounding um, in these regions where the cavity has gotten a bit larger. But in general, um, we haven't seen broad scale retreat of this system since 2016. Um, what is this area from a larger perspective? We can pull in bed machine results to say, um, if we look along a flow line, what kind of topography are we looking at? And as you can see, the grounding zone here is sitting on kind of this regional high point. So we have a really strong pinning point at this location that the grounding zone is currently sitting on. And this is probably why we're not seeing um, strong movement of the grounding zone at this point, despite some degree of ocean forcing. Um, yeah, of course we don't live in a 2D world, so just popping into the 3D world for just a moment, 
again, this is the seismic line that we've been looking at. Here is this local topographic high, kind of in general for this grounding zone. You can see that it's really strongly topographically controlled. It's, it's hanging out on these pinning points. Um, and there's this large scale kind of ridge feature and behind it we have this much lower um, topography. Although we'll note that there really is a lot of um, features that we're starting to resolve in here that may at some point act as pinning points for future grounding zones in the way that we currently see um, that the grounding zone is pinned right now. So I want to talk for a minute about the surface elevation changes we're seeing across this area. So this is all from um, worldview imagery that's actually within Rima. Um, and then, and so we at 2011 through kind of 2016 in these lines, again, this is that same transect we've been looking at, the seismic line. Um, we've got grounded ice over here transitioning to floating. I'm gonna throw on the grounding zones here for the same points in time. So 2011 set out here and then it jumped back. Um, and the big features of what we're seeing here is that there is some degree of thinning that's happening at the grounding zone. Um, and we've got this new low elevation feature that's popped up in this down glacier section. And um, my thought for what that is, is it's a rift. Um, and you can see that from aerial imagery. So here's Landsat. Um, and you can see that as ice is flowing across this area, it starts to pick up these rift features that are actually what later set crevasse spacing um, or a calving spacing down glacier. And the location where those rifts are first starting to appear has shifted inland um, between 2016 and, and 2018. So again, as we're, as we're shifting from kind of 2016 here to 2018, we're starting to rift further inland than what we'd seen since 2011 at least. And so I'm going to make the case that um, this grinding zone is relatively stable at this point in time, but we're seeing thinning and rifting. So um, in the way that Alex Robel presented on the first day of this meeting, that grounding zones can hang out on, on bumps for a while um, and thin as long as, as long as it's a particularly large bump, I think that's what we're seeing here. So we're, we're stable on this large bed feature, um, but because we are seeing thinning and rifting, there is active change happening, and at some point we might expect to see a pulling off of that feature. Um, and that's where thinking about mechanisms like flexure come into play because now all of a sudden these kind of seemingly small effects where exactly is seawater getting to start to play a bigger role because if we're able to do some melting actually up glacier of the grounding zone now all of a sudden pulling off of that pinning point becomes um, something we need to think about and so i would make a case that this is a region um, where thinking about flexure in this way becomes particularly important so thanks much to the two field teams um, who've been out there the last couple of years um, and uh, all the folks who funded this work. I'll take questions if we have time. <clears throat> yes, great. Uh, thank you very much, Kaya. Um, I think time-wise we are kind of riding right into the discussion. So uh, I would just open the floor for uh, questions about all the talks that have been presented so far. Um, yeah, and if anybody wants to start, uh, you can either try to put things into the chat, raise your hand, or or speak out. Uh, and also, I mean, it's first time for me at Waze. I'm usually attending Frisp. Uh, uh, everybody not feeling familiar with the community, just feel free to to uh, open up and, and share your thoughts. Otherwise, I'm just going to reiterate questions that have showed up in the chat. So if you've got a new question, this is a big chance. We can perhaps go quickly over the just the topics of, of the presentations that to refresh. Sure. Um, because we've been everywhere. We've been all around uh, the ice shelf system um, and all around Antarctica, to tell you the truth. So we had Sushil. Um, he was talking about um, basal melt rate parameterizations or estimates that were happening near the grounding zone. We had Julia who had been all around Antarctica looking at the changing area of ice shelves. We had Bernd who solved all our problems um, by, by looking at fern in uh, seismic data. Um, we had Lynn who um, was looking at the Ross ice shelf and uh, what happens when you thin at shear zones. 
uh, Elizabeth um, was telling us about ge geothermal flux on um, coastal domes. Rob took that off to the other end of the ice shelf and talked to us about uh, pinning points. And then Kaya, well, if you've forgotten what Kaya said, then you really haven't been paying attention. But um, she's been flexing the grounding zone for us. So there's a lot. If there's anything you don't know about ice shelves, somebody here can answer it. I say go for it. Okay, could I could I come back to Kaya's talk? Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but could she could I ask her to go over again why she thinks you get this anti-correlation with the tides right at the grounding line? Yeah, for sure. Um, that's because um, the ice has a elastic strength to it, and so effectively, if you're bending it down um, over here, you can lift it up a little bit over here. Right? And so as long as there's this fulcrum point, so you can imagine on a shallow slope, um, the, just the position of flotation might shift with the side tides, but where you have um, really steep bathymetric features like what we're seeing at the grounding zone um, of Thwaites at this point, you're effectively pinning the grounding point and so it acts like a fulcrum and you have this inland um, elastic response. Okay, just to follow that up, so in that case, so if if uh, just upstream the ground line, it was only really just lightly in contact, if you, as you'd expect on a grounding zone wedge, if it was uh, an accumulation of sediment that the, the ice itself had deposited, just building the sediment, you wouldn't expect this effect there. It's only where it's really, uh, there's quite an inflection at the grounding line. That's where you, you get this, yeah? Um, yeah, so, so you need, the, the, the like two pieces you need are, um, some kind of elastic subglacial material um, and a, a fixed grounding zone. Okay, thanks. Can I follow up on that, Kirsty? So it sounds to me like very small scale features would be required to uh, get that uh, ocean water pumped in across that grounding line. I'm, I'm thinking that you need to, if, if you had the idealized geometry that you showed, then, then maybe you maintain contact at the grounding line and there's no place to pump stuff in. Oh, but, if you, but if you have a lot of small scale uh, along grounding line variability, then that would open up as you flex the ice. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so I would say that you need like the large scale features of uh, like a pinning point that the grounding zone is currently sitting on, but then also you're right, like smaller scale roughness that allows for heterogeneity and where water can flow. But I think that's a reasonable expectation of grounding zones. You know, we so frequently think of them in this 2D space, but they're a 3D feature. And so um, in the way that I might expect to be generating pumping action at one point, I think, um, that that would be slightly decreased even just you know a couple hundred meters over um, is a reasonable expectation where you could actually be pulling in water at points. Yeah I guess the uh, the point I was trying to get at was what how much resolution do you really need at the grounding line to know what to expect in terms of fluid pumping? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't know. We're moving forward. The way we're going to kind of like test this theory, at least for this area, is that we have a nice radar profile across. And so we're just going to look at reflectivity of the basal reflector and see if we can see kind of how far inland um, seawater is extending, if it is. Um, and so maybe more, more work where um, with the resolution that we do have, seeing if there is inland ingression of seawater happening um, can help at least resolve where it's happening and then in those places saying something about what roughness is and then using that to say something about the resolution that you need to to make this happen but i think that's a that's an important question All right, maybe I can try a question then. 
Um, I was wondering, Elizabeth, on your talk, when you were looking at these distributed data sets and that you have, do you get any notion of, I mean, putting all the practical aspects aside, where we would, we should put our efforts to get more of this uh, geothermal heat flux measurement, where, where, where do, are they needed most? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, at this point, I think we'd be just about happy with it being anywhere, but um, particularly in areas that we haven't covered yet at all. So we found the results up in drawing one land slightly less useful as maximums, but potentially some other areas, especially on the Antarctic Peninsula, where we see a lot of these higher values that we're not quite sure exist, that would probably be the next place that would be ideal to focus. Yeah, it seems like Helen has to go, so goodbye, Helen. Uh, but other people, any anything you'd like to discuss about uh, something about the first uh, half of the talks, maybe? Or yeah, I, I, I could ask another question to Sashil. Uh, that's following up a question I asked him on the the chat. Uh, yeah, nice answer. Um, but I wonder um, the the kind of numbers he was using for for melt supply. Um, it's difficult to, for me to translate those into anything that's meaningful for me. They were kind of uh, four decimal places per meter squared or something. Um, have, has he looked at whether those kind of numbers are compatible with the, the, ups, the basal melt rates that are, are, are supposed? Yeah, that's a great question. Like, uh, so the units we had to use were meters uh, volume of flux of melting per meter of grounding wind width. So it's a little complicated, but we've compared those values against lake volume changes upstream. So it has a bunch of uh, upstream subglacial lakes and uh, those lakes have about a kilometer cubed of drainage. And if you look at the width of the grounding line at bed and divide it by that, so the numbers match up very approximately, if you notice, we had a log scale on our figure, so it's very, very broad range, and they do line up in those ranges, but it's really hard to get, A, get good estimates of subglacial flux from lakes, uh, and how much of the water coming across the grounding line is from draining lakes versus just a trickle of subglacial water. So it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to divide up those stems, but yeah, we're trying to figure it out. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I shouldn't have to ask Sushil this, but uh, what is the resolution of the worldview in, in time of the worldview data set for the deep melting? Uh, we, have, <laughs> we have three scenes over five years in uh, our bed, uh, and we can get them to acquire a few more images than we need to, so we have a project over bed, we can get them to uh, get us a few more, da uh, yeah. few more data points, especially in the next few years. But yeah, but typically it's a couple of scenes over five years everywhere. Uh, Kaya, do you have like any, yeah, you used value data. I think it's pretty similar, right? You had a bit more because it's late. Yeah, it, it totally depends on where you are in terms of how many cloud free images there are, but um, it, like for Thwaites, we get, you know, a handful of good shots per year. I just saw Julia nodding there because I know that you've looked at a lot of <laughs> imagery around the edges of Antarctica. Um, same for, for the success rates of finding the edges for you? Yeah, I mean, it was depending on, you know, trying to constrain it to just a January to February timeline, you know, it did 
there were areas that I think required a lot of um, self-assurance and confidence that I knew <laughs> where the line was located to navigate through, I think, both clouds and sea ice, but it's manageable. <laughs> Seems like I'm not stepping any on anybody's toes if I may post another question to, to Rob this time. Um, I, was, I was pretty intrigued by these uh, seismic images that, that you showed from, from this, well, former pinning points. Uh, uh, maybe this is a dull question, but do, do we know how old these are? Like when have they been ungrounded? That should tell us a lot about the glacial history there, but maybe everybody knows that except me. Yeah, so it, it's it's not great for the inner part of Pine Island Bay at the moment. Hopefully, uh, some of my uh, Thor colleagues are going to shed a lot more light on that from the cores that we've collected over the, the last couple of years. But, you know, we have that one really good uh, core, with really well-dated core, that's uh, only 10 or 15 kilometers north of the, the eastern ice shelf there. And one of the profiles was quite close to that. But that's, you know, that's saying that the grounding zone, at least, retreated beyond that point uh, 10,000 years ago, more than 10,000 years ago. It may still have been covered by an ice shelf after that. Um, but yeah, so it, 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 a ground, it wasn't a grounding zone or a pinning point since 10,000 years ago. It, you know, it, it's been accumulating uh, sediment, uh, including uh, seasonally open water sediment since that time. Um, but yeah, um, we see this widely that from the start of the Holocene, 10, 11,000 years ago, the grounding zones were right back into Pine Island Bay. Most of the post-glacial retreats actually uh, uh, happened before that time. And during the Holocene, uh, we, we really haven't got a great handle at the moment on what's happened during the Holocene. The, the Cairns have been very much retreat, but uh, there's another Thwaites project where they're looking at the possibility that, that there was some retreat beyond where the ice is at the moment, uh, and then a little recovery in the late Holocene. So that's what the, the Glacial uh, History Constraints Project is looking at that mainly through uh, cosmogenic dating on, on, uh, on the sides of, um, of none attacks. Thanks. I thought this was really exciting. And, uh, I'm more concerned with the water usually, so yeah, I, I don't know these things. So. Well, hope, hopefully we'll get some dates that, you know, tell us some of the things that are really close up to, because we've managed to get the ship really close to the front of Thwaites, that maybe we'll find some things that are actually, uh, actually quite young. I see, I see a comment in the chat from Trevor that's not directed at me, but maybe I can answer that, if, unless Rob or Kaya, you want to. <laughs> I think okay. we can all take it in okay. turns. <laughs> or maybe Trevor wants to read it out or post a question directly. Yeah, sure. Oh, no microphone. He's he's not going to do that. So I so I can read it out. Um, he says, is there anywhere that tidal pumping or grounding zone flexure could be recorded in the sedimentary record? Or is there no clear mechanism for that? So um, a lot, I don't know if Lindsay Prothero is on this call, but we did a lot of looking at um, grounding zone proximal sediment cores, and we didn't see any evidence of, of tidal pumping that you would, you would expect. Um, thin laminations, uh, uh, distinct changes in, in grain size. Um, I've, seen this in, I've seen this in one place though, and this is in the Puget Lowland, where it looks like there's evidence of, of tidal pumping at a former grounding zone, but I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it at least in the Ross Sea, where where I've mostly worked. I would add, though, maybe that that's not necessarily surprising, given that the Ross Sea is fairly flat and squishy, and I would expect that this would be more common in places like the Amundsen Sea, where we've got more bedrock control um, and so rougher grounding zones. So uh, if I could add to that, so this, this was the, the, the subject or the interpretation uh, of a paper in Science earlier this year by uh, Julian Downswell and co-authors, looking at some data. I, I can share my screen and show you the, one of their key figures if, if people are up for that. Yeah. 
Go ahead. So, go ahead. Uh, so can can you you see this this figure? Yes, we can see it. Um, yeah. So uh, I mean, this this is th these uh, they call these things rungs. Uh, they're very similar to things that have previously been described as corrugations. And the, the top the top left image is is showing uh, these rungs are sitting on top of a grounding zone wedge, and that they interpreted these as as being formed uh, by tight tidal oscillation of the grounding line during retreat. So that there's a little schematic diagram at, at the bottom right there. So uh, I mean it's 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 a very interesting hypothesis and. Uh, I, I can't really go any further with that because some colleagues are working on uh, on something uh, quite similar. <laughs> Hello? I'll stop the share. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are approaching kind of the, the scheduled end of the session. Has anybody like a, a final comment or, or anything? else to add to the speakers or except that we should thank them. It's really great. But... Well, I guess then it's uh, however you, you want to clap or <laughs> what, we, what we do on, on Zoom these days. But uh, yeah, uh, let's thank the speakers once more and um, well, uh, and enjoy any other any further sessions planned and we are not the last one i think no we are not no. i think there's another one later on today so uh yeah, yeah keep wasting the next few weeks um but it it was really great to have everybody here today thanks all the speakers <laughs>